joining us for the October Legends and Leapers program. We are still allowing people into our audience, but we wanted to kick things off with AMAX president and CEO, Ebony Wimbush. Ebony? Thank you, Charmaine. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast and good afternoon to you on the East Coast and in the middle of the country. My name is Ebony Wimbush, the president and CEO of AMAC, and welcome to the October installation of Legends and Leapers. Um, again, I want to let you know today we're going to have another dynamic and engaging Legends and Leapers conversations with two of the industry's best. But before I turn it over to our host, um, I am going to tell you about some of the exciting things that are happening in AMAC and in our industry. So I want to start with something that's really critical. Um, on October the 31st, that is the last day to submit your comments to uh, DOT's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking for Disadvantaged Businesses and Airport Disadvantaged, Airport Concessions Disadvantaged Businesses. Um, on behalf of our membership, AMAC uh, will submit important comments to the rulemaking based on the feedback we've gathered through the three stakeholder sessions we've had, but it's important for you too to go on and submit your comments. And so please remember October the 31st is the last day. Um, we've got coming up two important meetings to discuss our chapter. So the AMAC Chapter Development Committee will host um, meetings on the development of our local chapter initiatives those meetings will take place on November the 1st and the 3rd. Um, and then our emerging leaders, they've got another round of cocktails and conversations. Again, thought perverse, provoking conversation and networking opportunities for our future aviation leaders. And I have to say our current aviation leaders. That'll take place on November the 10th. And then of course, on November the 18th, um, we will have our virtual membership meeting. Now, those of you who weren't able to join this last uh, third Friday missed a great um, opportunity to hear from Hartsville Atlanta on their up and coming opportunities at all parts of their airport. Uh, we will begin having airports provide information and opportunity to, for you um, and so again, stay tuned on November the 18th, we'll have another airport guest talk about up and coming contracting opportunities. Um, last but not least, um, you'll hear more information on this, but on December the 7th, AMAC and San Antonio Airport will host our stakeholders reception for our annual Airport Business Diversity Conference. Um, of course, the conference is gonna be held this year in San Antonio. Uh, we did announce it on our membership meeting, but it will be held June the 10th through the 14th at the JW Marriott Hill Country in San Antonio. So please mark your calendar for both the stakeholders event on December 7th, and then our annual conference in June. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our, our co-hosts, Lauren and Ricky. Take it away for the introductions, please. Ebony, you got it right the first time. The first time you said host, and then you tried to clean it up with this co-host stuff. So I did. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> And then she was like, oh, that's right, Ricky's here too. Yeah, whatever, it's not your turn yet, Lauren, it's not your turn. All right, so welcome to uh, this edition of Legends and Leapers. Um, so excited to be, uh, to be with you again. Now, I missed the dress rehearsal. So I don't know how this is gonna play out this time. 
Um, Lauren, I think she was on the dress rehearsal and she probably screwed the panelists up. She probably told them all kinds of stuff about following her lead. I'm telling you, if you follow her lead, this thing is going down. John, you got to stick with me, brother. You got to stick with me. So my best. just a quick update on um, on what this Legends and Leapers thing is all about. So we, um, you know, several months ago, over a year ago now, I forget how long, how old Ed Legends and Leapers is now, but we came up with this idea that it would be good, entertaining and informative and inspiring discussion to have, you know, someone who is um, not necessarily new or young in the industry, um, but someone who is um, maybe older, but still emerging in the industry that has a fresh perspective, as opposed to someone like me who's been around for sort of 80 years and um, may be kind of stuck in my ways. Um, we think that sometimes you can find that there's a difference of opinion or a different perspective on how things can be handled. And what we've learned as we've had these meetings, these sessions, is that there's um, a lot in common, right? So um, that too is illuminating. So that's what Legends of Leap is all about. We have a, um, a legend, not necessarily an older person, but someone who's more established, and a leaper, someone who is not as established, but is um, certainly um, an emerging um, leader in the industry. And um, and we have a discussion. We do not tell them up front what questions we're going to ask. Um, I would say that was Lauren's rule because, you know, she just wants to be funky that way. And so um, they will be shooting from or flying from the seat of their pants on this one. And we think a good question is that question where one of them kind of looks up in the air to try to find their thought or to find their response. And so um, uh, that's what it's all about. So we're glad to have you here. Um, before we jump into Q&A, uh, we got to give Lon some time to say something. And so we kind of gave her this standard role in the whole program. And so Lon, go ahead and handle your standard role. Why, thank you, Ricky. I'm just blessed to be here co-hosting with you and allowing you on this platform with me. Um, <clears throat> So fun fact, guys, I too was not on the prep call. So oh. Dimitri and John have no clue about what's going to happen and neither do Ricky and I. So we're just going to see, you know, where this goes and we're excited that you all are joining us for it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to jump right into it and let's just talk a little bit about Dimitri. Now, Dimitri, I have to say this, you know, we talk about legends and leapers. She is a leaper, but she's also a legend in her own right as well. And you're gonna understand that a little bit more once I read her bio. So Demetria Wyman is the uh, Vice President of Business Development for REACH TV, concentrating on building and maintaining airport relationships and assisting airports in telling their story on the REACH TV network. Demetria believes that if we can change the way passengers view airports, it enhances the traveler experience. Airports are very much a part of our of your trip, and it, and it's not just a means to an end. Demetria has been in the aviation industry for nearly 15 years, first as a member of the concessions team at the Atlanta airport, leading concessions procurement projects and establishing marketing programs and brands for the airport. A marketer at heart, she cites one of the most cherished programs to be the Taste of Hartsville Jackie, where she recreated a street festival in the heart of the world's busiest airport. Demetria joined Reach TV in November and is excited about what the future holds as the company continues to grow. She sees endless possibilities for Reach TV and is committed to the company's motto, truth, positivity, and fun, as we bring a new era of broadcast entertainment to airports worldwide. Demetria holds an MBA with a concentration in international business from Clayton State University and a BA in business administration with a concentration in marketing from Clark Atlanta University. She is a mother to four awesome children and active in several community organizations. Now, John is our legend. <clears throat> Ricky, you, you said we've been doing this for quite some time, not as old as you are. You told your age when you came on Raising the Roof to the intro music. Um, but in the two years we've been doing Legends and Leapers, this is arguably the shortest bio I have seen across the board. Oh, wow. So, with that being said, John <laughs> Foucher is Mead and Hunt's National Aviation Services Group Leader. He serves on the board of directors for Mead and Hunt and the ACC Foundation. 
currently on AMAC's membership committee and a former AAAE board member as vice chair and chair of the corporate committee. John lives with his wife and three children in Chandler, Arizona. That is it. That Boom. Is I was only given like 260 characters. <laughs> John I said, I am a legend. You can Google me and find <laughs> out more. But for those that do not know, um, Meet and Hunt is one of the nation's leading architecture, planning, engineering, and program and construction management organizations, where John actually heads up the firm's significant aviation services practice. Um, he's highly adept at building skilled teams and forming key partnerships that provide clients with the highest quality. With over 25 years of experience in aviation project and program management, planning, design, and construction administration at busy general aviation to large, large hub airport air carriers, John is one of Meet and Hunt's most knowledgeable aviation team members. His program and grant management experience includes coordination with airport sponsors and the FAA to develop and manage airport capital improvement plans and grant applications for preparing and managing passenger facility charge programs. John's background as a project manager for several Mead and Hunt's um, most complex projects provides him with val valuable know-how in allocating staff and resources to meet schedules and budgets. Um, Ricky, this is also the first time that I've ever had to research um, and do some work in order to find just a little bit more information on one of our panelists so that the rest of the audience can know a little bit more about not only them, but also their company and what they do. John, Thanks, she's, John. Calling you out. she's calling you out, John. <laughs> Apparently so. I thought I was following the rules. Yeah. <laughs> the rules, rules with legend and leaper? There oh, are none. There are none. All right. So are you done getting in the way, Lauren? I am. I'm moving. Okay. Good. You admit that you're in the way. Uh, now, uh, and I'm sitting here and I'm and I'm looking at Dimitri on the screen, and you know, John, she she looks like a sleeper, man. I mean, she's she looks quiet. She has that beautiful smile, and watch when she starts coming with zingers. I hope you can get a word in edgewise. So we'll see how that works out. I promise to play fair. I promise. Okay. All right. Well. So let me jump right in with the first question. So um, you may have wondered this, you know, when you were first approached about Legends and Leapers, um, the question might have crossed your mind, why were you asked to participate on this program? So from your perspective, from your egotistical perspective, why do you believe you were asked, of all the people in this aviation space, why were you asked? to participate in this session. Ooh, who's taking that one first? John? I, 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 can, I can take it. So uh, I tried to get on, on your board and I will try, continue to try to get on your board. And I had two ideas. By the way, John, by the way, John, we want you on our board. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Looking forward to it. And so I had two campaign ideas and I had, honestly, this is, uh, I have to give the credit to my staff uh, they wrote two amazing campaign letters for me, and I think that's what tipped me over the edge and, and uh, you wanting me to be on here, plus with my 30 years of experience. I'm really only a legend in my own mind, but uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. All right. So um, I'll take a swing at that one as well. Um, I believe you all asked me to be on here because, you know, I'm advocating for telling AMAC members stories. So I've approached AMAC and talked to them about a series that Reach TV is doing um, called Ticket to Success. And I think you want me to use this platform to reach out to your members and tell them more about that series and encourage them to allow Reach TV to profile them oh, and that's what you tell think. their stories. I, I absolutely okay. believe okay. in my heart you want us to get out there and tell more of these stories. So here I am putting that plea out there and we can talk more about it today. All right, okay. Well, um, thank you for those answers. And um, I guess, you know, I'm not an attorney, so I haven't learned yet that you, know, you don't ask a question if you don't know what the answer is gonna be. So this was one of those cases. So anyway, another question, um, somewhat unrelated. If you can, um, if, if you can kind of peek back into your childhood, and um, and some of you may have to dig deeper than others. That's not a shot. I'm just saying, you know, um, 
can you can you pick a childhood experience that you think has most influenced you to be the person that you are now? And you can't say, you know, when you were one year, one year old, right? Yeah. Because one year old, you, you were only influenced by you know, the bottle. Um, you got so, that to me too? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a swing at that one too. I, so, I noticed, Demetria, you've been doing a lot of swinging. You know, yeah. this, is, this is not a violent show. This is not a contact sport. But. <laughs> it's to give a breath of fresh air. That's what okay. all this swing is. All right, all right, okay. <laughs> so um, I, I grew up um, the daughter of a flight attendant. And my mother flew for United Airlines for um, over 20 years. And while I can point to a lot of um, just travel-related experiences, mm -hmm. I'll never forget the first time that she took me on a trip with her to Narita, Japan. And um, what an eye-opening experience that was for me. I probably had to be in about the sixth grade and it was my first time out of the country. And um, it just broadened my horizons to go to Japan, to see the different cultures, to be embraced by people who didn't look like me, and just the opportunity to, to learn on a level that was beyond being in the books. Um, and I really believe that that first trip out of the country shaped my love for travel and aviation, but it also just furthered my love for people getting to know them, getting to experience different cultures, and the importance of um, preaching that to other people. I hate to say preaching, but sharing that experience with other people, um, because I see how it changed my life. So, you know, that's just a, a microcosm of all the experiences that I had as the child of a flight attendant, but it was one that impacted me most because I was in a, a foreign place but still decided to try to fit in, try the culture, see different things. And it really made me unafraid to do many of the things that I've gone on to do just since then throughout my career, school, et cetera. Okay, if, if I were to end this call right now, I, my impression of you, Demetria, leaving would be, she likes striking and she's, pre she's a preacher. <laughs> preach it off the table although Take i just preach okay. to my kids <laughs> okay there you go all right john <laughs> so i would say I, I i grew up in a very humble environment in the middle of wisconsin where my neighbors were cows so most of my uh, family were, were farmers um, two of my uncles were contractors so i've done everything from milk cows to uh bale hay to pick rocks to building houses with my uncles. And I think that's where I developed my work ethic. Uh, and then as far as, you know, the family atmosphere, humongous family. I think uh, at grandma's house every Christmas, there was over a hundred of us, but we always gave back, gave to each other, which helped, you know, be always putting people first. As far as getting into aviation, for some reason, I've always had a fascination of aircraft. Um, I actually, Younger wanted to actually uh, get into the Air Force Academy. That didn't work out for me. Um, I actually ended up being a pilot, so I kept that out of my bio. So I'd have something to say uh -huh. here. Uh, but I had the opportunity on my senior year in college where our CEO, current CEO, but at the time he was in head of aviation, came to us and he offered some internships uh, to work at an airport. And so always having that passion for flying and then being able to work on an airport uh, two and two went together, and 30 years later, here I am still today with that same company. All right. So my, my next question, um, and then um, Lauren will, will come up and she'll ask an inappropriate or off-putting question after that, but we'll get through that. So, um, so, so John, did you know Demetria before Legends and Leapers? No, I did not. Demetria, did you know John? I did not. Okay. And, and, and his brief bio didn't help much. I, <laughs> I tried to research. <laughs> so, so, um, so what, and this is for both of you. So Demetria, what advice would you give John to be successful in this industry? And John, I want you to give her the same. I want you to give, don't give her the advice she gives you. Give her advice as well. Okay. Wow. 
So what do I, what advice? Are you, are you looking up in the air? Wait a minute. I am already. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Ricky. Um, what advice would I give him? I would encourage John to really lean in on where the industry is trying to go with diversity and, and inclusion and to be a champion for that. Um, I've seen in my 15 limited or long years, however you want to say it, mm -hmm. what a difference it has made in not just my career path, but in ideas, in business practices, in um, the culture of aviation when um, we have embraced inclusion. And I think that it's a path that um, a lot of people, and I don't know if John has already embraced this, obviously he does from AMAC, but just to be a sounding board for diversity and inclusion, um, if this ind industry, which is gonna continue to evolve, but if we're gonna really embrace innovation and growth and change and all those things that diversity and inclusion bring to the table, I would encourage him and other legends in the industry to continue to be sounding boards for that. Um, because I think while we keep pushing towards it, there isn't enough. And I think that there's an opportunity for this industry to really take off and be on the level of those in tech and other industries where you see people really embracing it and it, it changes the thought um, when people are sounding boards for it and they attract more of it to the industry. So that would be my advice to this legend is to take his, his strength his muscle in the industry and continue to be a sounding board for it. Wow, good luck, John. Well, I actually have answers for that, but that wasn't the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got the mic, so. Well, well uh, and I think some of my folks on the chat line are kind of pumping up what, I, what I've been doing and, and I am a full, full supporter of it. Um, we even have an internal group just hired uh, an individual to actually be our, you know, quote unquote diversity director. So we're moving in the right, right direction with all that stuff. My advice to Demetria would be, I, I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're, you're asking the questions. You, you made a switch from working in uh, Atlanta to now working for uh, what we, some, some of us call on the dark side of things where you're now a consultant. You're doing your pushes to AMAC like you described. And you know, my advice, um, I was, had the opportunity to do a young professionals session where I went through my career and stuff like that. And my advice in that was, is to continue to be asking for the next next step in your career. And because the worst case you can get is the answer is no. But if you continue to push for it, show that you have your value, ask the question for the promotion or for the opportunity, you're gonna to continue to strive. And, and next thing you know, in five years, you're sitting in, in my seat here. Uh, but I think you're a prime example of what we are doing in the industry, what we are all trying to do to give uh, opportunities for individuals of, of uh, every background to be able to grow within in the aviation industry. Great advice. I, I think my boss is on here too. So I'll be asking for a meeting after this. <laughs> well, you've already gotten a commercial in, so your boss should be happy. Ricky, when, when you ask when you ask the question about their younger selves and what really transformed, you know, who they to who they are today, I was like, if Demetria mentions Reach TV back when she was 12. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. It's, it's the marketing side coming out, but no, um, John, I don't know if you paid Anita Cobb or not, but about 10, maybe 10 minutes ago, um, she said that you are unapolog you unapologetically lead um, Meet and Hunt's aviation group into lots of great work in equity and environmental justice. So that actually leads me to my next, well, to my first question, because someone ate their Wheaties this morning and decided to show up and show out with some of these uh, questions already. Stop but, insulting the guests. Stop insulting the panelists. <laughs> at any rate, so you know, one of the things that we we talk about, and I feel like it's a it's a buzzword right now, right? It's a buzz phrase. Is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is something that AMAC has been doing for decades before we had a, a coined term or a name or whatever you want to say to it. And a lot of times, sometimes, and Ricky's preached about this as well, 
we hear DEI and, you know, it's like, check the box. Mm -hmm. um, one of the beautiful things about AMAC, what AMAC does, what AMAC brings to the table as far as aviation is concerned, is doing more than just checking the box, actually opening up doors and presenting opportunities for women and minorities, right? Um, and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. So John, Demetria, how in your, either your everyday life or your professional lives, are you guys opening up the door and making sure there's opportunities for everyone to have a seat at the table? I'll, I'll try to start this one. Uh, so yeah, Anita's on the call. She is our shining star for um, the position that I talked about. She actually doesn't start until November 1. Uh, but, you know, I saw the opportunity in her and the drive and the passion as to what she was doing. And I, I went to our CEO and our CHRO and it says, I want to create this position. I think it's important to us. We're seeing it on all sides of our industry, you know, from the airport's perspective, from the government's perspective, from, you know, witnessing what was happening at AMAC. So it, it, went, it felt right to do it at the right time and had the right individual, but that's just one of the, the scenarios that we have in situations. Um, we are uh, internally, Meet and Hunt has what's called an employee resource group where we have all these, uh, they're called interest groups within there. And so one of them is of course, ethnic minorities and the other one is uh, women in, in aviation. And part of that, you know, we use them as sounding boards. Not only do they drive a lot of the initiatives that we're doing, uh, they're also sounding boards for, for ideas that we have uh, from the leadership standpoint, and they're involved in a lot of these conversations as well. And so use, using them uh, and discussions with us internally in our group, you know, we're starting to make some very intentional decisions. Um, Meet and Hunt started as a Wisconsin corporation. Uh, and we've grown tremendously over the years. So we still have that those Wisconsin roots where there's not a lot of minorities in Madison, Wisconsin, where we're started from. And I, that's where I originally was from. A lot of our other leaders actually spurred out of Madison. So we are now taking an intentional effort to actually go to the universities uh, that have much more diverse population in, in the background. So the uh, science, technology, engineering, architecture, math, and purposefully going there with hopefully past graduates as well in order to show, first of all, what opportunities there are in aviation, but more importantly, you know, can they make a career at, at Mead and Hunt? So our job is we're gonna, we're, we're gonna do what we can to hire uh, leadership positions, but we're also gonna may a, make a much stronger effort to grow from the entry level positions. And in five, 10 years, then they're also leaders as well. Okay, so I, you want me to jump in now, Lauren? Okay. Um, um, Demetria, you don't you don't need Lauren's permission. Well, I just want to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm like chomping at the bit for this one though, because this is really a passion point for me, which is kind of. It. But also, I'm so fortunate to work for a company that right stands real firm in this so um for those that don't know reach is a minority owned company and uh my boss the ceo uh linwood bibbins lives eats and breathes this like he's talking to us about it on a daily basis and we get to lean in on this from several different avenues so on the airport side or where we're doing media um whether we've got a acdbe goal or not he's adamant about the inclusion of minority owned businesses in our business model as we service the airports. But then we also get to lean in on this from a creator side. So he's constantly out or we collectively, I can't just say that it's Linwood because it's ingrained in the culture of the organization that we're constantly out looking for minority creators to have their work displayed on our screens. I mean, we've got this massive audience, millions of people get to see our content and what better way to support the ecosystem of minority creators, but then to have their work displayed in front of travelers from around the world. So um, we lean into DE&I from that perspective. Um, if you take a look at our, on our company website and look at um, who leadership is, all the people who make things go at Reach TV, it's a diverse group of people. Um, so I think that we just eat diversity and inclusion. 
Um, but it's really at the core of what we do. Um, we're very connected in all of our content to culture and community. Like that's the that's the foundation or the baseline for anything that we put up our, on our screens in addition to truth and positivity. So all of those elements together require diversity and inclusion. How can you talk about travel and the world without being immersed in local cultures and communities? And then who best to tell those stories but the people who live in those cultures and those communities? So um, we get the advantage of being able to um, talk about DE&I and live it. Um, and it's what makes us successful. So um, it's it's huge for us. It's huge for me personally. That's my background. I grew up next door to the leader of the Black Panthers in Denver, Colorado. My mother was a community activist. So it's something that's always lived in me. And it, I've been able to grow that throughout my career. And then I finally landed in a place that directly aligns with everything that I believe in. So now understanding your neighbors, I understand where striking and preaching comes from. I <laughs> it's natural. I can't help it. <laughs> it's so interesting because Demetria grew up next to the Black Panthers and John grew up next to cows. So it's <laughs> 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 Oh, that's funny. That's funny. So speaking <laughs> speaking of, so John, because all we know is that you're on several boards and that you, your wife, and your kids live in Chandler, Arizona. Where were you before, um, before, excuse me, <clears throat> meeting Hunt? I was a Zamboni driver at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Zamboni driver. Man, I've always wanted to drive a Zamboni. My kids played ice hockey. Wow. Time out, time out. First, you're being serious. Yeah, I've, I've been 30 years. I was a senior in college. It was my sixth year, but I was a senior in college when I got employed by Meet and Hunt. So I okay. so um, I always tell people, and of course, I'm stealing this from somebody else, is you know how people jump around. In some industries, you have to jump around in order to grow. Uh, I, I was lucky enough not to have that. And really, it's it's about making and driving your own path, kind of like the advice that, that Demetria has gonna, you know, been following, is making sure that you set your own path, you're entrepreneurial, and, and you're the one driving the bus. And, you know, the grass is always greener. Well, my job was to make sure I watered my side of the lawn, so I stayed on this side. And so I've been here for 30 years. Or driving the Zamboni, I mean, pun intended. So, okay. Were you recruited by Meet and Hunt? So I'm assuming six years. Let's let's talk about this, right? Engineering programs are usually about five years. Some people it takes six. You are one of those individuals. So did you intern with Meet and Hunt? How did you transition from being a Zamboni driver to being um, with the company you're with now? So the, well, there, there are there are transferable skills, Lauren, that I don't think you're grasping. Yeah, precision cutting. <laughs> <laughs> and and of and avoiding the pucks from the when right. they push the hockey players off the rink. Uh, that was my college job, and so uh, and um, as soon as I got my internship with Meet and Hunt, um, that's when I, I stopped being a Zamboni driver uh, because I was I was lucky enough to um, my next semester of school, which was my last. I only had Tuesday Thursday car courses. So I asked my boss, I was like, hey, can I stay on as a technician, work Monday, Wednesday, Friday? He, he said, yes. And then I graduated and I said, can I have a full-time job? They said, yes, and I'm here today. So that, you know, that's how the transition. And then um, in 2002, I moved my wife and I out to California to run uh, Mead and Hunt's first aviation acquisition uh, in California. And then three and a half years ago, uh, because I was traveling so much, I wanted to be closer to a larger airport. So then I moved my family to Chandler, Arizona. So, so John, we have we have about 25 minutes left in the show. So by the time we're done, we will complete your introduction, okay? Because you know we're still <laughs> kind of working through the introduction. So slowly but surely, <laughs> slowly but we're getting there. Um, so so let um, let's let's try. So um, the the team, the AMAC office team is, is just amazing because they, um, they're always making sure that we get stuff right. So um, it's actually, this is our second anniversary of Legends and Leapers. We, the first one was October of 2020, according to um, the amazing Shemaina. And so um, with, that, with that context, uh, why is this kind of dialogue important? I mean, um, I mean 
you know, uh, we don't always agree. Often we do agree on stuff. Um, you know, we have people in the audience who some of you, you, will may, you, you may never see or know um, who are hanging on every word that comes out of your mouth on this, during this program. Um, why is it so important that they hear from you? So um, I'll jump in on this one. I, I remember when Legends and Leapers started um, during the deep, dark times of the pandemic and um, how happy I was to reconnect with people in the industry, even though they couldn't hear me, just listening to people talk and um, talk about, you know, where the industry was going and giving us all some hope that we would rebound. And over time, even though we're back to being face to face, to face I tune in every month to hear different perspectives, but also to do what you just said. It's like, you know, although it's a one-sided conversation, it's like a conversation with people in the industry that I may never meet, but that I admire, who can drop gems and give advice that I can follow, take information and implement it on my own path. And um, it, it's, a, it's a huge confidence builder for, I think, for a lot of people to just be able to hear about different challenges and say, oh, I can relate to that. Or, you know, to think themselves about the questions that you're asking about how they navigate um, this, this industry and their career. And um, just to, to give some guidance for a lot of people in a space where a lot of times there isn't any. There's no defined path out here in aviation is what I've learned. People hopscotch around, people's paths to the different to the top are very different. And it's you don't find a textbook out there that tells you how to navigate aviation, um, especially as a minority. So um, being able to watch legends and leapers and just get a glimpse into career paths, business paths, possibilities that people get on here and talk about has been tremendously helpful to me. And I think a lot of the people in the audience or other AMAC members would agree that um, it has helped their trajectory um, as we come out of the pandemic and then use it, using this as a tool going forward. You want my perspective now too, Ricky? Yeah, we're just taking that in. So yes, yes, John. <laughs> so yeah, Ricky, you and I, we've probably been to what, hundreds of conferences over the years. And uh, we've seen plenty of scripted conversations, you know, from presenters. And, you know, I'll, I'd like to ditto everything Demetria said. Um, it's just a breath of fresh air to be able to have an unscripted conversation. You don't know what's going to come out of the individual's mouth. And usually it's the honesty, right? It's whatever pops into their head. It's like taking one of those um, personality tests. You just, gotta, you just gotta answer the darn thing. You can't think about it. And that's what's really good about this because then you can really hopefully see the real person. And we have, you know, watching all, watching all those legends and leapers. And, and uh, I um, watched several of them when the pandemic did hit because it was really refreshing. Uh, and similar, you know, for a plug for the AMAC annual conference last year was the first time I ever went. And that it's there's just a totally different energy at that conference than anything I've ever experienced before. And so then watching this, you get it every month then, which uh, very much appreciated and kudos to whoever, uh, you know, idea this was. This is great. Go ahead, Lauren, say it was your idea. Go ahead, tell them. <laughs> I mean, I was just, I was just going to just let that be there, you know, Ricky, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um. So April said, Ricky's still processing Demetria's answer. <laughs> Excellent and so true. <laughs> we do have several questions in the chat, but Ricky has monopolized the majority of the show today. So I want to make sure that I get a couple of my questions in because John, I had asked you about just your transition from being a Zamboni driver into meet and hunt. And Ricky didn't even allow me to ask Demetria. So for those that do not know, Demetria uh, was with the uh, Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport in the procurement office. Um, if you did not know her then and you only know her now, you see that her background in marketing um, and just her passions have just flourished, um, which they always did, but now on a professional level as well uh, with her being 
uh, with Reach TV um, doing let's, business. Let's, let's call it ever present. Ever present. <laughs> ever present. Right. Ever present. But what I what I want to hear a little bit, Demetri, and you talk about people, you know, moving around throughout the industry. You went from being in the public sector, right, um, to now private, um, and really very different. So, one, what prompted that transition, and what has that transition been like for you, professionally and personally? Um, it's funny because I'm at a ACI, the Marcom conference in Vancouver, and this same question came up um, this morning at breakfast. And I think it's probably one of the most asked questions I have when I tell people that um, I worked in the concessions department at the airport and I'm okay, now- Okay, scratch the question then. I got another one to play. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's good, but it's important, you know, I think to, to, to talk about it um, because it is um, joining the dark side is what um, people tell me. So um, the transition um, has been tremendous for me for several reasons, but I'll tell you one specifically. As a you know, business development marketing person on the airport side, there were all these things that I always wanted to do, but didn't have the tools sometimes to execute them. And it's not just the red tape or the bureaucracy. It's just that, you know, I didn't know what was available to me to help give the airport a voice. When I came over to this side on Reach TV, I saw all of the things, these tools at my disposal that I felt like I could then take back and help people execute all the things that I couldn't get done. And so that was super exciting for me um, to be able to go back to these airports with some answers and be like, hey, I've been where you are. I've sat in my, that seat. I know it's tough. But, you know, I found some answers over here, um, you know, in this data analytics, you know, in this media, in this technology that I'm this world I'm living in that is going to help you. So um, and I'm I'm very much an advocate of giving back on all levels in my life. So just being able to give back to people who are sitting on the other side and possibly make their jobs easier is exciting to me. But, you know, also being able to come to the table with an airport perspective, right? And so when I'm talking internally in the company and I can, you know, they've got these ideas and they're kind of griping about the airports. I'm like, oh, but wait a minute. Hey guys, this is why it's set up like this. And this is how this functions. And if you don't get so frustrated, but we innovate on ways to kind of maneuver through the minutia over there at the airport, we could possibly get things done. And then to be able to do the same on the flip side, when I'm talking to my old colleagues or new colleagues that I meet, just about how we can help them reach their goals, but being understanding of the confines that they're working in. So um, that's been particularly exciting for me, um, just having that landlord tenant perspective to bring to the table and how it possibly can help, you know, solve a lot of problems for people out there in the industry if we all just give it, uh, each other the chance to work at the same speed. I push the airports a little faster. I kind of slow down the people on my side so we can meet halfway and actually get some things done. So, you know, that's probably been one of the most exciting parts of making that transition. And I will say, Lauren, that I was one of those people that was within that great resignation. When everyone was resigning and finding new opportunities, I got the opportunity to go home. I've got four children um, and work from home. And we were having dinner, you know, like at dinner time. And I wasn't in there stuffing food down their faces and all those other things that can be challenging for a single working mom. Um, I found in working at home and then it just so happened that I found a place that I could go where I can still do those things, but still feel powerful and productive in my career. Hmm. I'm waiting for permission. <laughs> Oh, well, I wasn't going to give it, but I saw that, that there was a pause. So I'm actually going to jump into some of the questions that we've been getting uh, since we started, Ricky. So hold tight. All right there, buddy. Okay. So <laughs> one of the questions um, is directed toward John. John, what about Meet and Hunt's current statistics of diverse suppliers as partners on some of your aviation work? What's the current statistics of diverse suppliers? I believe so. Okay. Uh, so I don't, I don't have those stats off the top of my head, but we did just begin earlier this calendar year putting together an ESG report, so environmental, social, and governance. 
And we are tracking that stuff. And I probably should have read that this morning because I would have probably given you a, a better uh, number on there. So what I can tell you is that we are being intentional about um, not only, you know, the suppliers that we get just for stuff to operate as meat and hunt in our offices is another thing, but then also we're being very intentional on developing partnerships with minority firms uh, in, in areas where um, they have a, uh, they're all, you know, they're all qualified definitely, but areas where they are able to help us win work. And then it's a, we try to work on a reciprocating type of relationship. Then there's other disadvantaged business enterprises that are nationwide. And then of course, if we're the right fit for them, you know, we have a partnership. If we're not, we try to find another one. But you know what we're doing. So in summary, it's we are definitely making a more intentional effort on creating those stronger, stronger partnerships uh, for the value of both. We've also done some mentor mentee uh, programs. Uh, one up in Portland, uh, and then uh, for our military side, which still does aviation airfields. Uh, we actually have a joint venture with a, a disadvantaged business enterprise where we, we help them grow in, in the industry um, and um, build their qualifications as well as build, us up, build ours. Awesome. I have another question and I'm going to I'm going to pull this question, Ricky. I hope you're paying attention mm -hmm. um, because I'm going to throw this out there to you as well as, you know, somebody who works within the. BWI. Oh, you want, you want me to be a panelist now? Is that well, a I'm, I'm going to throw a question out there because I don't know how uh, well John will be able to answer it, but I want to be able to give some perspective. And I heard that you work within the BWI airport ecosystem in some place, form or fashion. So with that being said, there is a question that says, are there any opportunities to consult on wellness, self-care and work-life balance opportunities within the aviation space? So I will say this because I want to keep this form, this form, there are many opportunities and I would, I would suggest responding to that individual offline and I can help that person reach out to other airports as well to get that kind of answer. Um, so instead of doing that, let me ask a question. Here's the question, because I, I want to get as much out of the panelists as we can. So um, Demetria, you, um, you mentioned um, when you were responding to the question about you know, what role Legends and Leapers played back in 2020 when we were going through the, um, those dark moments of COVID, um, that it, 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 the speakers gave you hope and they gave you optimism, that kind of stuff. And so looking at where we are now in this industry, and this is for both of you, um, is your outlook optimistic or is it pessimistic and why? Um, so just the, the the return to travel has made me very optimistic. Um, I'm not sure, you know, some people are like, ah, oh, it's overcrowded. It's all of these things. Prices are expensive. But just the pure fact that people are still embracing travel, getting out to connect with other people, because that's what it's all about, right? Connecting with people and cultures. Um and even with the economic downturn, but still people's just sheer will to get out there and, and see the world makes me very optimistic. And it makes me optimistic, not for the sheer numbers or the return, but the excitement that signals growth to me. And so, um, you know, it was very bleak. And I was wondering, were people ever going to come back? Because, you know, there were so many people out there that had all these dark forecasts. And I just feel like people just bucked all of that, you know, all of that, those dark words that people had to say, and they said they're speaking with their feet and their, their, their wallets, getting back out there and returning to travel. And so um, I think that the, the, the industry needs a little bit more time to just adjust, because I think that the people who are in our airports, the demographics have changed. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing different travel behaviors. But as we all adjust and things resettle, um, I see astronomical growth in the travel industry. And I think that that should give lots of us hope um, from the businesses that are established or the people who are looking to get into this industry because it speaks opportunity to me. Um, and I hope that a lot of people out there feel the same because we've got to be optimistic to be innovative and to get out here and make change and make opportunity. 
and to dive in and take advantage of what is going to happen. But a lot of us may be scared to jump back in. And so um, I'm, I'm excited about it. If you can't tell um, just about what the future holds for the industry. Yeah, you're, you're a little bit excited. <laughs> I'm always excited. <laughs> So, John, when historically speaking, right, you, a lot of times we hear people say, oh, AMAC is for airports and is really hones in on concessionaires, right? And we all on this, this, this uh, platform know that AMAC is so much more than that. Um, from AEC, you know, from construction, from being, uh, having representation from every part of our aviation ecosystem. So with you representing Meet and Hunt and Meet and Hunt being one of the nation's leading architecture, planning and engineering and program and construction management organizations, tell me a little bit more about what Meet and Hunt has not only been bringing to AMAC, but what you've been receiving as an AMAC member as well. Okay, so uh, we are, I think your only AEC corporate partner, I'm, I'm guessing from the website, unless somebody came on. Um, so we are you know, quote unquote, putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, but we're also putting a lot of energy and time and resources into helping uh, AMAC move forward. I believe we've got, I think, seven folks that are committed to uh, committees, uh, and it, as well as, you know, those, the nationwide committees, and as well as those that are in the regions, they're going to join the local um, AMAC chapters as well. So our, our commitment is there. And, you know, what I plan to do as a member of the membership committee is my, my goal is to spread the word around about the value of being an AMAC member and really bring more of the AEC type of firms, both the minority as well as the larger firms uh, that are not of minority status. Just because, you know, my, my one experience with that uh, one AMAC conference was that AMAC prides itself on the networking, and that was completely evident there. And so people are, are, are my, my mission with my team is to say, you're missing out. You need to be part of AMAC because of all the benefits that uh, we all saw uh, with our commitment to being at the conference and our commitment on, on the committees uh, across the country. You get out what you put in, right? Ex exactly. So it looks like we have about six minutes left and part of that will be, um, I guess, Ebony Wimbush who will come back. Um, do we have, do we want to take another question from the audience, Lauren, or? I don't know, Ricky, my last question you shot down. So do we want to take another question from the audience? Well, 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 John didn't get to answer my, the second part of my question. I mean, what's up with that? Okay, we're even now, Ricky, but you know what, I will, I will move out the way and you can re-ask your question for John to answer. He paused, so I don't know if he wanted to answer it. So I was coming with a better question. I so thought maybe he was thinking, thinking about Dimitri's response. You know, he, I kind of cut him off last time. So I was giving him that six second break, I, right? I, 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 it, 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 it takes a bit to, you know, to absorb what she says, right? Because she's so profound. Right. And Karen said you, you're a little slow and it does take you longer to take things in. So the combination of the two, um, it makes sense. Karen needs her own talk show and to leave us alone. Tell her to go get her own talk show and leave us alone. That's so in fact, the ALC fireside chat, uh, this <laughs> last one, <laughs> Karen did a phenomenal job uh, moderating that panel, uh, but I digress. So John, Ricky did have a question about um, just uh, the reemergence of travel and what that's looked like um, as far as kind of our post-pandemic world whether you're optimistic or pessimistic well i'm i'm definitely an optimist um you know the the pandemic and everything else that happened before and during the pandemic actually taught us uh, quite a bit they actually taught us as consultants to be very efficient both virtual teams like we are on today or zoom uh, as well as to not forget about that social contact that people have and honestly one of the struggles that we have in the consulting world is is young professionals not understanding that they're missing that social piece that we all prided on you know prior to the pandemic it was natural you just traveled everywhere so 
you know, hopefully they're, they're listening to us here and knowing that, you know, you need to get out and, and reach somebody for lack of better terms. But also what we saw during the kickoff of the pandemic is leisure travel went crazy to the locations that did not have such high restrictions. And so now we're even seeing that pent up energy from those that didn't get to travel. And now businesses are opening back up to travel that, yeah, we're like Dimitri said, we're going to be, we're hitting this economic issue. We're hitting higher prices, which we're hoping that's only going to be a hiccup uh, in time. But I believe the pent up demand for people to get out and actually visit folks to do business as well as leisure is going to, is going to come back in, in uh, 2023. So I am very optimistic on, on the future of aviation and the opportunities uh, for everybody to be innovative and provide new ideas to service uh, clients. You know, you got sustainability, you got resiliency, you got DIB um, initiatives and, and the needs out there. So there's actually more opportunities and will be more opportunities for people to actually be part of the aviation industry and provide new services. John, two things you mentioned, and I know Ebony's going to jump on, but I do want to talk about this before we get into the after show. Two things you two things you mentioned was just kind of honing in on young professionals and the importance, you know, to network, right? And another thing you talked about is just more opportunities that are going to be um, presenting themselves and coming up in the near future, right? From a lot of different areas, more than what we already see within our industry. Um, as the chair of AMAX Emerging Leaders, um, two things, twofold. Give me some advice, both you and Demetria. What would you tell young professionals, emerging leaders that are trying to find their space in this industry right now? Get involved. Um, within our organization, you know, I've got 240 people just under my aviation group, and over 50% of them have less than five years with the company. And so you've got a lot of people wanting to get out and do something, but if they're my discussion with them is if you're providing value to an organization by providing your time and they're seeing value and you're bringing value to back to us as long as value for your own professional development, then you get those opportunities to do that. And so it's back to my you know, um, guidance to Demetria is you got to push for what you want, but you also got to provide value at the same time in order to be able to justify the, that push, but get involved. Um, and, and we I, look I, forward to having some uh, emerging leaders from Meet and Hunt on our committee as well, John, with that being said. Sounds good. Okay. Sorry, Demetria. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say really quickly, um, I've got these three E's that I live by, and I would encourage young people to, even though they're not in positions of power, to put these things forward. Because when you um, put things out in the universe, they come back. That's what I believe. And they're encourage, endorse, and elevate encourage other people to get out there and um, make things happen, endorse people. When you see people doing good things, speak kindly about them and where you can elevate people. That's usually for the people who are in positions to uh, give people other jobs or promote other people, but people who are new to the industry can elevate people as well through helping on projects, helping people get the notice that they need. Um, and so it's reciprocal. If you put it out there, then people will put, push it back on you. So I have a fourth A, and that's Ebony. When she comes on the screen for the fourth time, we should age her. <laughs> so I, I have a, I have the, I, I've re, I've coined the the four E's with both John and Demetria. So that's engagement, encouragement, endorsement, and elevate. And with that, I want to thank you for joining another great edition of Legends and Leapers. As it relates to elevation, let me tell you. So what I didn't say earlier um, is our theme for the conference and what you guys just described really um, aligns nicely. Our theme this year is cultivate, innovate and elevate. And so as we look at our content, as we look at networking opportunities, as we look at um, all of the various programming that happens, we'll really be focused on those three, um, those three kind of themes and mantras around cultivating, innovating, and elevating. And so what happens now is the after show, the show after the show. Uh, but to be respectful of everyone's time, those of you that have to go 
And um, thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Um, again, check out all of our events on our website and now for the after after party. We need some music for that, all right? There's like a, a, there's, there's a tune happening in my mind, but I'm not gonna sing it. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a song that, that some of you know. I'm not quite an emerging leader, but I'm not embracing whatever is next. So hang on for our, our, our after Legends and Leaper show. And back to you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, and I do want to just throw it out there as well. You know, we talked about young professionals, emerging leaders, um, AMAX Emerging Leaders has our cocktails and conversations on November 10th. So if you yourself are an emerging leader, young professional, or you know someone within your organization, please make sure they are registered to attend um, this, uh, this dynamic conversation. And we really want to reach out to individuals that are not yet a part of the aviation industry as well to just show them all of the greatness that you guys have seen here, um, but ev everything and as far as opportunities within the industry. So thank you. With that being said, now the good questions get to come on out. So, um, Ricky, if you don't mind, can I ask the first question of the after show? What if I said no? And then I'd be like, okay, Ricky, well, I'm about to ask it anyway. But <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to be respectful of my elders and at least ask for <laughs> So, all right, John, your bio talked more about your kids than it did um, your actual professional <laughs> experience. Wow. <laughs> we know Demetri is a mom of four, so you have two two kids. How old are your kids? I have, I have three. Three, okay, three. I have 19, 14, and 10. Nice. So how has that balance been for you? I know Demetria talked about just her transition um, into working with Reach TV and having more flexibility and being home for dinner. Um, with your experience and how long you've been with Meet and Hunt, have you been able to have those experiences? And are you seeing that more now? Um, kind of our post-pandemic world? Do you feel like you've missed out? Tell me a little bit about that. I've actually gotten really lucky. Um, so pre-pandemic, I was traveling Monday through Thursday every single week that I was not on vacation. And But none of my kids were in a lot of sports. Um, and then when my daughter, when my middle child was a gymnast, I, I went to every single meet because uh, they were on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of been good 15 years I've been like this. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, um, my wife actually quit her job the day prior, which is a blessing in disguise because then she was able to manage all the online schooling that the kids had to do. But then what was weird for me is I was went from traveling every single week to then traveling not for six months. So I was a little stir crazy. <clears throat> Don't have an office in our house. We just have open areas. So uh, you know, the transition was good, but now the kids are a little bit older. They're still not in sports. Uh, so it's like uh, they, don't even re they don't even realize when dad's gone. <laughs> Which is, at least they're not saying, hey, when are you going to leave? They right. just don't yeah. you know, realize when dad's gone. But it's all good. And Demetra, you've been a you talked about being able to balance, just have more of that work-life balance. What neither of you guys talked about is what do you do outside of work? Yeah, so I was I was actually thinking about that term work life balance before we got on this. The, the whole balance thing is impossible. So what I do is reappropriate my time. I shift things around um so things work in my favor hopefully most of the time. But um so I'm active in my community outside of all of this. So I got a couple of things going on. So I'm in a couple of organizations that are very heavy on community service. Um, they're social in nature. So it does allow me to get out of the house and be with some adults and, you know, and hang out a little bit. Um, and then I am also on the verge of being a first time author. So um, I wrote a children's book about HBCUs that'll be published in the next month. So I try to find things to like, keep my mind busy and creative um, since I'm not living in that marketing space. Um, so in spare time, I make flyers for organizations, uh, for my children's schools. Um, I'm a self-taught graphic artist, but I go to YouTube University. I learn new tricks and then I take and um, execute them to push myself to continue to do something new. So right when I turned 40, I took on running. So, you know, I started to run like... Um, 
the Peachtree Road races and things like that. But I just think that you have to constantly introduce new things into the routine to keep your mind fresh, you know, to keep uh, to keep yourself moving and um, just, you know, to keep myself sane probably is most of it. Um, and that, so, yeah, I do a little bit of everything outside of work. Just to so this part of the show is it, it allows us to ask more probative questions because this is kind of like the secret part of the show. So I have a question for you, Demetria. John, this is not for you. So you talked about some of the other stuff that you do, Demetria, like um, making flyers and stuff like that, which is, um, do you use company equipment to print and copy <laughs> the stuff? When you, I work from home. So the answer to that is no. Okay. All of these things are done on my own equipment and, okay. I, and I pay for it myself. Okay, I right, just, just, just check. That's part, of, that's part of my uh, tax deductions when I you know, give to these organizations. Okay. Now, when now when you see Demetria's flyers and her um her graphic design business on the Reach TV screen, <laughs> tell us in that story. <laughs> that part, yes, <laughs> it's fun though. So, well, John, John, before Ricky really interrupted you, um, tell me about how you reallocate time throughout your personal life. What do you do when you're not working? So um, my two, me and my two older kids, uh, we do off-road dirt bike riding. Um, and so I've got a 450X, so does my 19-year-old son and my uh, middle child has a 140. Uh, so we have all green machines. And so in Arizona, you can go just about anywhere. And uh, don't, we, don't worry, we're all full, fully suited up, so we're all protected. Uh, and then uh, do a lot of hiking, walking the dogs. Um, we go to Sedona quite a bit and do a little bit more hiking up there. We love it up there. Um, and then I'm a, I'm a yard work freak. I'm, if I could be outside 24 seven, I'd be work, working on the yard and just clean, cleaning it up. Um, and then our, our youngest likes to snuggle. So that's usually movie or, movie or showtime where she snuggles on the couch. So that's that probably majority of my free time. I also, um, I um, am a volunteer for a Live Love organization, which uh, takes care of uh, Chandler youth, uh, as well as uh, some elderly folks that can't um, maintain their yard. So we do that uh, and, you know, find other opportunities, soup kitchens and things like that, where we spend our time. Um, Demetri, do you want to name the organizations you're part of? You said they were rather social. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. So I'm a member of the Order of the Eastern Star. Um, so I uh, work in my chapter there. And then as an extension of that, people usually haven't heard of the Daughters, but uh, Shriners is a men's organization. The Daughters is a women's organization within that. And so I'm very active there. They're very social. So I travel around, I go to charity balls and just and hang out. And that's my kind of my reprieve. But, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my children are also in sports. So I really don't know when I have time to do the rest of this stuff. <laughs> I, I was going to say that um, because you like added more work on to the work, even though it was personal work, it was still work. So uh, what, so John said his kids are not in sports right now. What sports are your kids in? So my daughter plays volleyball. She's 12 and she is a beast. So we're getting ready to get in the club volleyball. I'm loving it. That's new for me. Um, mm -hmm. And then my, my sons play basketball and baseball at times they're both in high school. So they're kind of peppering that in. My oldest is in college. So he's just, you know, doing his college thing. I'm just gonna warn you club level sports for the parents is a contact sport. Yeah, <laughs> so I've heard. Oh, First yes, of all, it's expensive <laughs> and you gotta travel around, but it's it's cool. It's my only girl. So, you know, just want to, I wanna embrace every step as she, you know, matriculates, so. So I don't know about you guys. I know Ricky, Ricky, your daughter's gone all over the darn near the world at this point playing hockey. Mm -hmm. Demetria, you, you, you know, done this four times over. So growing up, I'm from Detroit. And when Ricky said contact sport as a parent, so we would always go to Flint. I apologize to anybody on this call that's from Flint, Michigan, but you know where I'm about to go with this. Mm -hmm. It never failed. There was always a, a physical altercation, excuse me. <laughs> in which involved usually the parents. Parents, yes. That's where it started. And it was usually the parents of the, like the Flint teams. It wasn't necessarily our parents. But again, being from Detroit, there was always like something, it, it, it did get physical for parents. So outside of the, the monetary investment and everything else, 
See, Lyndon said, what up though? Hi. Yeah. Um, it, it does get very interesting. Now, John, your kids are not in sports. Their dad has an engineering background. Are they involved in, in STEM programs? So my son is studying business uh, at the community college, and then he'll transfer to either ASU or AU. Um, and uh, the two girls are just wicked smart. So uh, one wants to be a veterinarian and the other one's only 10. So she doesn't know what she wants to be yet. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, you have time to do the, all the off-roading and everything else because you're not at a different activity every day with a, a kid. That's correct, yeah. But I bet their projects are off the chain. When oh, you yeah. are submitting these at school, I know they're like, what is this? So I'm sure you are over the moon or over the top with all of those projects and things you're building. I can only imagine. So John, I was gonna say this, you know, I'm in Levine. I'm probably about 30 minutes away from you and Chandler. When London does get to school, when we have like science projects and whatnot, I'm sending her your way from an engineering background. Because my volcanoes are just going to be like some baking soda and whatever. Your volcanoes are probably going to be like battery powered, <laughs> eco-friendly. Structural just, analysis. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just, I'm putting that out there now because I want, you know, my daughter to have balance um, and also win science fairs. So I just, I'm planting the seed. All right. <laughs> I'm always I'm always the person that does this. Um, so you call me, um, I guess, Ricky ruin it or something. Um, I have a candidate in my conference room that I have to start interviewing. Oh, well, just bring I, him on, Ricky. To take up. Say what? I said, just bring them on. We'll let you know if we give it a yay or a nay. I will add edge, ledges and leapers to part of the recruitment process now. <laughs> As you should. Well, what, well, with that being said, you know, we know that I could hold down this show for another hour. Um, but Ricky actually, Ricky came to play today. He came out, as Demetrius said, he came out swinging. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate that, Ricky. Hopefully and he you came can, out preaching. <laughs> hopefully you can sustain this um, for the rest of the year. Um, I appreciate it. But Dimitri and John, thank you guys so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your knowledge and just bringing your transparent and authentic selves um, today. So Ebony, I don't know if you have, you have, you have more that you wanna add, but Ricky, thank you for showing up for the first time in two years. Wow. Um, thank you for the opportunity. This was, this was great. Did awesome. Awesome. Thank you. The, the comments, the comments, you guys probably weren't able to see some of the comments, but the comments were very, very positive as well. Good. Good. Thank very you good. guys. Have a fantastic rest of the day and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.